6. I think many of us have heard the seven deadly sins. Okay, it's pretty famous. We've already got Del Yonan. That's how famous it is. It's like, just put me to sleep now. <laughs> but um, <laughs> when I was growing up, and I know Tori will love this, but uh, MTV, if you don't know what that is back in the 90s, yeah, Taylor's like, man, that's my childhood right there. Okay, well, when I was in fourth grade, okay, this is back in the 90s, Kurt Cobain just just scared my whole school because he, he, he killed himself. And I didn't know who that was because I was raised by, uh, you know, a very conservative family. We didn't really listen to the radio, didn't have cable. And MTV, of course, is known for music, television. But if you look over here, Nirvana, uh, at this time, Kirk Owain from the Pacific Northwest, that's the number one music live album of all time. Because part of it was because he did it right before he died. Like, just within 10 days, maybe two weeks, okay? And so MTV skyrocketed. They began to really connect with a lot of people, obviously, the music videos. What's interesting is they began to do documentaries on musicians, and one of them came up with the idea. This is 1997. They decided to do an MTV documentary on the seven deadly sins with musicians. So that's right, folks. We got Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones, and we're going to ask him, what do you think about pride? And this is a direct quote. Man, I am part of the best band ever. And some of you feel like, that. actually, that might not be wrong, but it's like, but it's still pride, right? Um, we have other legends, rappers, it didn't matter. Country musicians, Garth Brooks, doesn't matter, okay? What do you think about? And they would name a Seven Deadly Sins. So, literally Aerosmith, okay, from Armageddon. Dream on, dream on. That's my impression, okay? This, this, sorry about that. Some of you are haunted now. Okay, but Aerosmith, what do you think about lust? Direct quote, lust is what I live for. It's why I wanted to be in a band, right? So every girl and woman would go for me, right? You could, it doesn't matter which person or musician, ask them about something from the, the, the seven deadly sins. Anger. It's necessary. I'm an artist. It's how I bring this tension and life together to create dope songs. That's a direct quote from a certain rapper. You know, you guys can look it up, okay? Obviously, this is not good because we see 30 years from now, here we are just living it up. Now, let's look at Proverbs 6, okay? The seven deadly sins that they, MTV, was asking about, okay, what they were asking people about are not actually in this portion of Scripture, okay? Lust, greed, sloth, laziness, none of those are actually mentioned. In fact, the seven deadly sins literally comes from a Catholicism and a lot of the writings back uh, at this point, close to a thousand years ago, where they wanted, again, the, the, a lot of the, the government was tied into the Catholic Church. We want people to be controlled, and so we're going to tell uh, priests what to, to preach. And so they began to, to, to stress and push certain kinds of lifestyles that they did and didn't want. And so that's where a lot of the writings we get, Dante's Inferno being very famous, uh, when in fact the seven deadly sins are not in the Scripture. So when you see... Look at the title here on the notes. I put in question, seven deadly sins, that's a question. They are, of course, deadly, but they're not the ones you're thinking or have been taught. In fact, one of my favorite, it's not my favorite movies, don't, don't go watch it, it's quite dark. But Brad Pitt plays in a movie called Seven, right? One of the most shocking endings, literally, of, of any film. And it's about the seven deadly sins, when in fact, those are not here in Scripture, okay? So Proverbs 6, let's look at this, okay? Chapter 6, verse 12. We'll read it again. We'll go 12 through 19. A worthless person, a, a wicked man, he walks with a perverse mouth. He winks with his eyes. He shuffles his feet. He points with his fingers. Perversity is in his heart. He devises evil continually. He sows discord. Therefore, his calamity shall come in five to eight business days. Monday through Friday. No, it says it will come suddenly. Notice the word again, verse 15. Suddenly he shall be broken without remedy. Verse 16. These six things the Lord sort of tolerates. No, he hates. The Lord hates him. 
Glendale Baptist Church, he hates them. Seven are an abomination to him. What are they? Pride. A proud look, a wine tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift or quick to run to evil, a false witness who speaks lies. What's the seventh sin? One who sows discord among brothers. It's amen, even though it's probably ouch, right? Dell, would you pray one more time for us? Father God, we again thank you for your word today. We thank you, Pastor. Uh, and we're proclaiming your scripture to us, Lord. We just pray that you open our hearts and our minds, Lord, to perceive that there's any areas of our, our lives that we participate in this stuff, Lord, and that flee from it. We thank you for your guidance through your Holy Scripture, God, through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just, just a quick warning. You can see in the scriptures, it's pretty rough language that the Lord does not like. Okay, so again, we're closing up Proverbs. We're closing up Proverbs. I, I, I've had a, just an amazing time. We've looked at friendship, sexuality, money, um, work ethic, discipline of children. It's just fascinating. It's fantastic. It's how to live our lives based on the Word of God. Amen, amen. But now uh, I wanted to, to end by looking at these things where like, we really need to make those, those things in our heart, we need to be convicted and say, Lord, you're right. I need to change based on the things that the Lord does not like. And, and am I, of course, all of us are unworthy, but by God's grace, he can forgive us and we can move forward. But as we close, let's look at this last portion of scripture. Remember, this is wisdom literature. It's written in a poetic form. Okay. And it's written to Jews in Israel. It is not written to Glendale. It's not written to Douglas County. Okay. So verse 12, there's a worthless fellow. He's a wicked man. He walks with a perverse mouth. As you guys see on the screen here, you can see that the idea of worthless man is there's without profit. And this just breaks every parent's heart. If they have kids that, man, my kid is a good for nothing. Right? We don't, we don't want that of our children. Right? They don't bring any blessing at all. They're, they're either lazy or they've caused major trouble. Maybe they've, they've had some kids that they're not taking responsibility for. Maybe they're, they're always in trouble with the law. Whatever it is, you see the idea here. This person does not have any profit in their life. There's nothing like at least or, you know, around here we love our community. If the person is at least a coach on a team, yes, they're helping the community. That's a blessing, right? Amen. All right. Cool. There's something. This person... Solomon says, this is this guy, man, there is no value. And you have the idea there. He's a wicked man. Guys, it literally is trouble. And I think all of us, how many of you parents, especially in a small town, because I've learned this living in Glide and now here, you can see the person walking down the main street of Glendale, Myrtle Creek, Glide, whatever it is, and you go, just the way they're walking, here comes trouble, right? And we're trying not to judge, but you're like, there's some body language that says, stay away. Right? You know this, right? Here comes trouble. Solomon says, man, this person, you know it. Maybe we have these tendencies in our heart. And they not only are no good for nothing. There's nothing of value. But notice verse 12. They walk with what? With a perverse mouth. Guys, they pattern their life. They pattern their life around this wicked behavior. We know this, right? People with, with, without fathers, they struggle like more likely to be in jail. Then there's folks that, that studies tell us they're just always, always in trouble. They're never going to, quote, get it because they constantly go to trouble. Guys, I put it, please, please hear the word today. You look at the word walk in your notes. I put this down. It is all over the New Testament. That Jesus Christ, when you trust him and you, he died on the cross for your sin, you now... Well, you trust in me to walk in newness of life. You need to pattern your life around Christ Jesus and his sacrifice for what he has done for you. You pattern your life around sacrifice for others. Worship of him. Decisions for him, for his glory. Your continual pattern of life now is not my will, but thy will be done. That's it. That's what you, you need to be about when you come to Christ Jesus. And it is such a heavy, heavy theme. This person in Proverbs verse 12, he doesn't care about any of that. He's going to do what he wants to do. And his mind, look at verse 12, it's perverse. 
Guys, it's crooked. It's distorted. They don't care about others. They don't care about the love of Jesus. They want what they want, and they're going to do what they want. And honest to goodness, get out of the way, right? Get out of the way because here comes trouble. Notice verse 13, they wink, right? They wink their eye. They shuffle their feet. They point their fingers. All of that to say basically, if I'm paraphrasing, no big deal with my actions or what comes out of my mouth. No big deal. Come on, I know we've seen this in school, right? It's like you're studying for a test, right? You're doing the best you can. You've legitimately, quote, kept yourself clean, right? I'm trying to do what the teachers want. And it's like, I swear, I always see somebody not do any of the work, always get in trouble, and it's like they always get away with it. No big deal. Their own attitude, yeah, whatever. It's no big deal. They wink at it. The idea of wink is their viewpoint is only their evilness. It, it just narrows completely to their life and what they want to do. Their actions, they shuffle their feet. We can see what their decisions are, right? We, we hear what comes out of their mouth. And so it's no big deal to them. Whatever. I got in trouble again, got expelled, whatever. Right? Doesn't matter. I, get, I mean, come on. We've seen this at the jobs, right? They get written up how many times? Doesn't matter. Right? Safety violation after safety violation. No big deal. Oh, uh, yeah, it is. People have died at the mill, right? People have died at certain jobs. Construction, right? They have been disabled. This is a big deal. Not to this person. They're evil. Whatever. I want what I want. Notice verse 14, perversity, evil, fraud is in their heart. Guys, they are okay with the sin. They are okay with being fake and fraudulent. Notice it continues. They devise evil constantly. Not just once in a while, constantly. They sow discord. This is what they spread out in their families in their communities, they don't care. They just spread it out. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to act and treat people in a perverse and fraudulent and evil way. And I don't care. I'm going to do what I want. You can see that this is pride, is it not? I want to live how I want to live. I don't care about anyone else. And you can see it's building to verse 16. I want you to look at verse 14, please. Please, in your Bibles, it's okay. The Lord knows that you're studying his word. It's okay to circle sows discord in verse 14. I want you to circle that because you're going to see that as this passage closes today, our author Solomon ends with the same phrase, sows discord. Even for brothers in Christ, we sow discord in our churches, do we not? Uh-oh. Oh, we're about to get to, to ruffling feathers now, right? We sow discord, so we need to be absolutely careful Verse 14, he just does this. He does this, he does this. And the idea of discord, as you see, uh, we, should, we should have it there. Verse 15, excuse me, uh, if not, it's all good. Um, I apologize. It's the idea of strife, animosity towards others. This person is, is constantly not only evil, they're openly going to be putting that out there. Okay? They're openly going to be putting that out there. There's always something evil going on in their life. Oof. Man, some of you, get, I get nervous just even going through it. Look at verse 15. Here's where it gets interesting. Therefore, in light of that evil nature, in light of that pride, in light of that continual walking and, and perversity and sin, verse 15, therefore, his calamity will come at some point in the future. What does it say? It says suddenly. It says suddenly, guys. It means instantly. Now, I could give you a whole bunch of examples, but I thought in, in honor of Aaron, because I was your age. Just kidding. Uh, why don't we look at this stud muffin up here? Oh, man. Look at this guy. Nobody laughed. All right. Okay. Right there. That was me at 26. Nobody even smiled. All right. I thought I was a stud muffin. <laughs> but when I was 26, I'm in Glide. At that point, I'm going to say I was on the 15th setup when I finally realized it's definitely me, right? I am not doing well at these dates. I need an ace in the hole. I need a good car. <laughs> Chicks just aren't going for a Hyundai. <laughs> so I decided to get a really, not too hot, but a really nice Mustang with a spoiler. And when I bought it from the lovely couple in church, they gave me two pieces of advice. Don't go too fast, because this baby, this is a V8, man, it'll go. 
And then they said, so what are you gonna do now with your chick magnet? It's like, I'm going on a date, of course, right? And just FYI, I didn't you know, meet Tanya for three more years. So it did not work out as I was hoping, but I'll tell you what, one of the best things ever is when you've got a spoiler and you're taking turns on the way to Bandit or Gold Beach, man, you just, you just hug. You just hug the road. It is so awesome. It is the closest I'll ever feel to Vin Diesel and Fast and the Furious. <laughs> like, yeah, baby. Well, I'll tell you what, after one of the times another girl ended things with me, <laughs> I tried to, to take solace, so I said, I'm going for a drive, and I'm going to let this baby not roar. I'm going to let this baby purr. And I, I, I mean, I tell you, I was cruising. And if you guys know, glide all the way to Roseburg is literally straight. You can see for miles in any direction. And I was like, I'm going to let this baby soar. And I'll tell you what came upon me suddenly. The lights of a police officer. And uh, not only did they come on suddenly, I to this day, I have no idea where it came from. Like, I knew, I know the 15 miles, Roseburg to Glide, like, I had to do it every Monday and Wednesday for, to, to teach at UCC. It's like, there's literally nothing out here. And I'll tell you what, that guy came out of nowhere. And how many of us have been, don't raise hands. You know what, don't raise hands. Yeah. How many of us, wait, right? The, 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 the thing came on suddenly. All of a sudden, I got written up at work for being late. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, the cuffs were on my wrists. Okay, uh, our, our pastor when we were in Myrtle Creek for the, the year there of, of unemployment, that's how we, we got to hear his testimony. He's like, I'll tell you when I came to Christ. It's when the handcuffs were on. Because my mom came and said, I'm disappointed in you, but I love you. Amen, right? Like all those moms, like I'm disappointed. But at that moment, he's like, Lord, I need to get right with you right now. And he's been following the Lord ever since. That suddenness, all of a sudden, I forgot to study and I got an F. All of a sudden, the friends I had, it's not looking good. All of a sudden, I've got some issues. Guys, it comes so quickly. Our behavior has consequences in this context. Look at verse 15 again. See the word suddenly. It's going to happen. Notice the poetry continues in verse 15. Suddenly, he's broken without remedy. This kind of behavior has consequences. This prideful behavior. I'm going to do what I want. I think I'm the best thing ever. I don't care about anyone else. Suddenly, suddenly. Look at the repeated phrase there. It's going to be happening. The consequences. I never saw the cop. I never saw him. You can sense my bitterness to this day. <laughs> right? Like, I never. Where did he come from? Fun fact. Are you guys ready for this? Tanya and I get married. We're going to go to the island of Kauai for our honeymoon. We leave the wedding venue. We're like, ooh, we're married. I took this very vehicle to the Portland airport to get on our flight to Hawaii. I never saw the lights of the police officer. I got pulled over again. But true fact, that one I got a warning. That's right. That's right. And Tanya was good luck at that point, right? I got a warning, but I'm like, I never saw this guy. I sold the car about six months later. I'm like, this thing is bad for me. Right? I never saw it coming. I never saw it. Be ready. Be ready. Our actions have consequences. Here we go. Verse 16. The, the quote, seven deadly sins. What God actually says. Verse 16. These six things the Lord hates. I want to stop there because we live in a society. God's love. God loves all of us. Amen? God cares for us. He cares for you. He cares for where you're at, and he cares literally what you're going through. That can be true, okay? The pendulum as a society is over here, where we think God I, apparently loves us so much, he allows us and tolerates whatever we do. That is horse nonsense. The pendulum also has God does not tolerate sin. Look at verse 16. This is harsh language, guys. These 16... Six things the Lord sort of tolerates? No, he hates. I direct your attention to the screen. I even put it in bold so we don't misunderstand the Hebrew. God hates it utterly. That means he does not tolerate it. He can't be around it. There are going to be severe consequences for it. The language continues to escalate. Yes, there are seven things 
that are an abomination to him. Not only does he utterly hate them, they are disgusting filth that he wants to be abolished. There will not be an amen on that, right? Like he hates this. Guys, I want you to just bear with me here. Look at verse 12. I know we're bouncing around here. Look at the harsh language. Worthless person. Wicked man. Walking in perversity. Calamity. There's nothing loving here. Why? Because verse 16, God hates pride. We all have pride, do we not? Verse 16, there are seven things that are an abomination. The first one is pride. God hates it. You'll notice that there were six things that he utterly hates. And then it goes up to seven. Why is six? And then it escalated to seven. What's up with that? Guys, this is poetry, wisdom, literature. And the idea here, okay, I'm going to give you some examples. The idea is that not only does he hate it, but the escalation of disgusting abomination that God just cannot stand it. It is escalating. Are you with me? Okay. Like, just, just, just bear with me here. I've got a, a, a couple of examples here, okay? My mom, she has a pet peeve. Her pet peeve, she did not want her children to bicker. So she would just clamp down on it. My mom has, that is her pet peeve. Why? Because she grew up in a very large household, and her family and siblings never, ever got along. They bickered constantly. Constantly, excuse me. And even to this day, there's still some friction there. So my mom personally had a pet peeve. She would not allow my sister and I to bicker. Does that mean that I can now beat up my sister, not do my homework, and just stay up as late as I want? No, because they still don't like that behavior. They just have a real, you know, pet peeve over that one. Some of you think that I ask that you take your shoes off when you come over to our house. Nope, you can do whatever you want. I appreciate you guys asking. Does that mean you just start trashing our house? not right like you still have there's a balance there right like i still don't like the other stuff okay it's still a problem and so what is it that is escalating look at verse 17 it's a proud look right here guys it means to look down upon okay i want to be explicit here not only is it to look down upon but it's whatever field whatever job you have you're looking down upon others. Maybe they don't have a job. They're not as good as you. They don't have as much experience as you, right? You're going to look down upon them. Guys, it can be education. Look at my degrees, right? It can be your position at work. I'm the boss. Y'all need to do what I say. It can be about your family. My family's better than yours, right? It can be your social status. Guys, we literally had... For centuries, the feudal system over in England, right? If you're a, a, a knight or a lord, you own everybody outside of the king, right? And you look down upon people. We do the same thing today. Look at the political language over how we treat certain ethnic groups or demographics, right? We put our, what's, hey, at least I'm not a panhandler. It's like, okay, ouch, but you're still, you know, you need Jesus, right? We throw out things all the time. It means to be better than others, right? I, I think that, and I'm looking down. <laughs> Unfortunately, guys, pride, you know this, it not only divides, it infiltrates everything else. Amen, right? It does. It does. It infiltrates every single thing. I wanted to pause here, and I wanted to, to be very, very uh, careful here. The word means to look down, okay? To look down upon others. I wanted to give us, it is okay, deep breath here, it is okay, and there is a good kind of pride. Bear with me, okay? As philosopher Thelma said, that's my guy, right? Is there a happiness and a joy over your spouse? Amen, right? Like, yeah, that's my guy, right? Because you're proud of the fact that God has provided that person. You're excited about what God's been doing in their life and growth with that person. That's a good kind of pride. There's a good kind of pride when you have, as an athlete, I have legitimately put in the sweat and the tears and the growth to be the best athlete I can be. That's a good thing because at that point you have not, I'm better than everybody else, and then Aaron goes around looking like this, right? Like, yo, I'm better than everybody, right? That's, that's where the pendulum went the other way, right? The moment you start thinking you're the best thing ever. And so I wanted to be very, very clear. Guys, it's okay to have, quote, a pride in the work. 
Okay, one of the things, uh, if most of you have seen my, my house down in Sacramento where I grew up, um, but this is not an exaggeration. If you go front and then the backyard, there, I have 60 neighbors on the street, right? Kylie can confirm this. She's been there, Taylor's been there. Like, there's a lot of people crammed in. It's not like Glendale where everybody's got, you know, elbow room, elbow room. Okay, so at one point, around 14, I was mowing a lot of yards. And at the end, it'd be 100 degrees, you'd be sweating, but you'd look out and you'd take, you just walk down and you'd see eight houses and you're like, the yard looks good, right? The, the sweat of the brow, that's a good kind of pride. I never ever was like, that's right, I'm the greatest landscaper of all time, hire me, right? No, I was not doing that, okay? But there's a good kind of pride. But unfortunately, look at verse 17, a proud look to look down upon. This is the clear birth of sin. All the way back to the garden. You'll be like God. That's right. I can do what I want. I will be the guy. It, it passed on from Satan, kicked out of heaven because of it, and then it was passed on to, to Adam and Eve and now us. I think I'm better than everyone else. Not to brag, but I'm the greatest pastor of all time, right? Like, yeah, yeah, no, 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 you're not, right? Okay, a proud look. To look down upon. What's the second thing? A lying tongue. A lying tongue. Obviously this is a commandment. The Lord does not like the lying tongue. As we look at these two together. This is a scary, scary thing. Because salvation is right here, guys. Pride separates us from Christ. We don't think we need a Savior. And we lie to ourselves about it. It's the woman you gave me. I don't know. It's... It, 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 it's it's, it's that, that snake, man. We never take responsibility. We lie to ourselves. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. These two are intricately linked. And guys, if we take our Bibles right here, let's, we were to hold our Bible out. I only have to turn one page. Look over to chapter 3. Just turn to your Bibles real quick. Salvation is on the line right here. Salvation is on the line. Chapter 3, verse 34. What does God have to say? Not only does he hate pride, but when it comes to salvation, he literally resists the who? The proud. But he gives what? He gives grace to the humble. The humble who says, man, Lord, I've messed up. I need salvation. Lord, I have done wrong. I've been prideful. Guys, I can give so many examples. The thief on the cross. What are you doing? We are being punished for our sin. Jesus, remember me today. You've done nothing wrong. And what does Jesus say? Today you'll be with me. How about the prodigal son? Man, I have messed up. I'm going to go to my dad and say, Lord, I've sinned against you and your name and against heaven and earth. I'm no longer worthy. Lord, just, Father, just make me like a slave. And the father says, man, hey, you're my son. Right there, there's that, that grace given. And the father runs to the son. One more. How about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, a wee little man. He's a tax collector. He's been stealing for years. He meets Jesus. And what does he do? He gets rid of his pride. He says, man, Lord, if I've taken incorrectly, if I've stolen, I'll give back four times as much. And what does Jesus say? Today, salvation is here. Amen. Amen. Guys, if you just let down your pride, I speak from the bottom of my heart. This will unify all of us today. This is the easiest thing to do. It's the hardest thing to do. I've got to say I'm not the best. I've got to admit I need Jesus. I've got to admit that I don't have all the answers. I've got to admit I've made poor choices. It's the easiest, hardest thing for all of us to do, to let our pride go, to stop lying to ourselves and say, you're right. I need Jesus. I need forgiveness. I have been prideful. I have lied about it. Glendale Baptist Church, this is the easiest, hardest thing to do. It unites all of us this morning, does it not? It unites all of us today. And this is unfortunately when we stand before the Lord, our pride is what will either lead us to salvation because we humble ourselves or it will lead us to separation from God. I can do it myself. I don't need God. I got this under control. I don't have a problem. Our pride pushes us away from Jesus. And ironically, it's the very humility of Christ Jesus that led to our salvation. That he emptied himself. He humbled himself. And took on the, the form of a bondservant 
to, to, to be the death on the cross that we needed. Jesus' humility led to our salvation and our pride. Destroys churches, destroys community, destroys families. Our pride is what pushes us away from God. I'm begging you, don't be prideful. Cry out to Jesus today. <laughs> and all of us, we could all come forward, could we not? I could spend the, the rest of the year just looking at that. A proud look. A proud look. But let's continue. Guys, verse 17 continues. A hands that shed innocent blood. This one breaks my heart. This one breaks my heart. Because you see on the screen the idea here is that, we, that we're pouring out. We're taking something innocent and pure. And we're crushing it. that supports the killing of innocent babies. We live in a society that sheds innocent blood, that spends money to do so, and we call it women's health care. We live in a society that not only sheds innocent blood, it manipulates innocent children in sexual regards, does it not? We know that our government is also in some capacity doing something in regards to sex trafficking of, of young children and not stopping it. I am sorry to bring this news to you today. We live in a society that is shedding innocent blood. Mm. Now, as long as I'm here, that will not be the case for this church. Amen? <laughs> right? That we will be a light to, to, to the, the dark society that, man, we will preach the word, Lord. I think I, again, speak for all of us here today. I've been prideful. I have told lies. But by God's grace, I have not shed innocent blood. Lord, forgive us as a nation, but Lord, as a church, I have, we have not supported that. We've been, we've been pure. Lord, forgive us, forgive us of the first two, but we've been standing firm on your word that every life has value. Amen. <laughs> that everyone was created in the image of God, that everyone was created to worship God, and that he loves every single created human being. Hallelujah. We have taken that value away and said, no, it's my body, my choice. Now, again, I want to be very clear. As a nation, we're doing that. If, if you've got family members that have struggled through that, I mean, man, guys, I've known two ladies. They struggled with guilt for years, but hallelujah, they came to Christ Jesus. And man, amen, amen. He forgives, does he not? Amen. He wants you to be restored. He wants you to have that relationship with him, and that's, that's what it's all about. And so he can absolutely forgive. <coughs> That doesn't mean we don't have consequences. What else? Verse 18. The Lord hates a heart that devises wickedness. Wickedness. A heart that has inner person that says, I'm going to go out of my way to cause harm to someone. When you combine that with what we just read, we now have you know, government officials, people that are openly devising wicked plans that kill innocent, innocent people. We've seen on the news people that are innocent are just getting arrested now. We've seen innocent blood of young children wickedly planned out. There's a clear agenda in regards to sexuality of young children. It is being purposely devised by wicked plans. Lord, forgive us. <coughs> Lord, forgive us. Because we are now supporting that as a, as a nation. And the Lord, the Lord hates these things. The Lord hates these things. What else? He hates feet that are swift to go to evil. This one should break your heart as well. He hates that idea that we, we quickly can't wait to violence and, and create riots and, and stir up that animosity towards each, each other. The Lord hates it. I believe you guys know the phrase, birds of a feather rock together. Right? When the violence, what happens? You quickly get into that, quote, mob mentality, right? We see it every election year, right? There's people that's, ah, we've got to do it. And they run to that violence and evil. Notice the idea of evil here. Oh, this is so powerful. The Hebrew means malignant. <coughs> Many of us have, have, have family members that have struggled with cancer. And the, the best words are, it's in remission or the cancer is benign. Right? The tumor is benign. It means it's not going to cause harm. The word here in Hebrew for evil is it's malignant. And you guys know what that means. It gets worse and worse until at some point there's nothing you can do. And the loss of life occurs. The Lord hates this kind of swift action, this mob mentality. This, I'm going to go quickly to this malignant evil that does not restore anything. 
It doesn't restore anything in our families, our communities, our kids. It destroys all that it touches. And God hates it. Verse 19, we're almost done here. The Lord hates a false witness. Now, wait a minute. Andrew, wait a minute. Verse 17 says he hates lying. What's the difference with a false testimony? Guys, bear with me. I know we're almost done, okay? But false testimony, the Lord, remember this is written to Jews. It is written in the Old Testament. And the Lord had already given them numbers in Deuteronomy. This is how I want the criminal justice, the judges, to behave. Not only did you have to see someone be accused, but you had to have multiple witnesses that would confirm or deny a story. Not just one, multiple witnesses. And so a Jewish individual that would purposely say, I saw something, is not only lying personally, they're now ruining the life of another, and they're literally corrupting the system that God had placed for law and order. The Lord hates it, because you're now destroying lives you're destroying what he set up to keep sin from running wild. How's it going in our country when we know we have judges not upholding the law? How's that going? We, we know we're like, why didn't that guy get arrested when we saw him murder someone? Because some, there's perversion of justice. And it eats away at us, guys. It eats away at the Lord. He hates it. He utterly despises what he set up is now being used as a lie. So that's the difference, okay? It is so different. One's a legal system. The other is a commandment. And the Lord hates both. Now this should bring us to our knees today. It is something I do not like talking about, but we have to talk about it. The last thing that the Lord hates. He hates someone who sows discord among who? Among brothers. He hates he hates the sin of a person that goes in and causes strife in their family. I believe the phrase, my relative is high maintenance. Some of you are like, oh, man, I know who you're talking about. It's like, I didn't name names. <laughs> but we all have high maintenance. Like, it's always something. There's always something wrong with them. Or they're always gossiping. Or they're never stable. The Lord hates that sowing of discord. The idea that they're going around purposely trying to destroy the unity of brothers. That means, folks, as a church, when Paul pleads with the church in Ephesians 4, do everything to maintain the unity of the body. When we have church splits, to be brutal, it means God hates that. Now, I want to apologize. I want to tell our younger ones here. If you're in church more than three to five years, steady, wanting to grow in Christ Jesus, it is to my shame that I publicly say you will probably be part of a church. Think back to how long you've been in a church. Be honest. There's probably been a church. Play. And you know what it boils down to? Pride. Guys, I, I, I've been... My wife and I have been blessed. We love the fact that our parents raised us in the church. There's no regrets. But my wife and I would say we've been in church at least 30 years. And we've seen at least five church plays. Okay? When I was in Glon in 2005, to my shame, pride was definitely in. There was a, there was a church split down in Sacramento. And I started sowing discord. I didn't like the families that left. Started throwing them under the bus. This was pre-Facebook. So you actually have to call people and get together over coffee, right? We're going to talk about the Lord. And then really it's just a, 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 a jam fest about how you don't like their decision. Okay? Pride, discord, no rebuilding, no wanting to be unified. Guys, in 2012, I was blessed to work with Pastor Mike. We had this meeting. A guy just finally said, uh, I'm done with this. I'm going to start my own church. I'm tired of how you're doing it. I'm tired of this. A lot of I, I, I. Guess what happened? Three, four years later, the church dissolved. What a shock. Because it's pride. Tanya can tell you about her issues in church uh, that she grew up in. They're still not completely recovered. Because the Lord hates it. Guys, he hates it because it's nothing about pride. I didn't like the pastor. I didn't like the message today. I didn't like how it was going. I, I, I. The Lord hates it. Sowing discord. Guys, this is from the ESB Study Bible. I know Bruce has this one, but if you look at the notes, it's easy to agree the Lord hates the first six. But as Christians, we love to overlook this one, don't we? That I have been part of the problem. 
In 2005, I was part of the problem. In 2012, I wasn't, but I absolutely, after that guy said that, I'm going to defend my pastor who has been there for 25 years, who has mentored me, who has been there by my side. I'm going to sow some discord about that other fellow. I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me. And all I can do now is by God's grace not do that and say, Lord, I'm not going to do that, uh, that you bless me here. I'm not going to do that. And guys, I need your prayers as pastor. We do not need the division, right? The Lord is the one that unites. Pride divides. God is teaching a clearly through these passages here a hatred of sin. And why is God ending the way he's ending? What is he teaching us? Because Glendale Baptist Church, to be absolutely brutal, many times the church split is nothing more than our pride. You know this to be true. I unfortunately know this to be true. I didn't get what I wanted, so I'm going to throw a fit like a four-year-old. And I'm going to throw people under the bus. And we've all done it. Lord, forgive us. Again, this should unite all of us. I've chosen sides. I've been the reason people are arguing. Dare I say, as the pastor now, at some point, the longer I stay faithful to the Lord, it may mean that there's discord because I just don't like Andrew. That happens, doesn't it? Jesus is what should unite us. Jesus saved us. Jesus, in humility, not only in humility, he modeled for us the attitude we're to have. But he, he modeled what should unite us today. I'm begging you today as we close for that invitation. I think I speak for all of us. Man, I we could all come forward today, could we not? The pride. I've had it. I've told lies. Father, forgive us. But if that's you today and you would say, man, that's me. And I, I want to be right with the Lord, man. I'll be right up here. Let's get right with the Lord. Father,